hello. So this is unusual. You don't normally see me sat here, um, but they've let me talk about, well, let me talk to Richard tonight because I seem to get all the slightly embarrassing male problem thinkings that we host here at Tortoise. Uh, yep, yeah, so they let me loose on hair loss a couple of months ago. And now we're going to talk about testicular cancer. Uh, perfect Thursday night out. Um, Richard, thank you. For coming in. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Um, and this is Richard's book, which we're going to talk about uh, a little bit. Can I have my ball back? It's available out in the foyer. Um, and it, I mean, it was a brilliant book. I really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. Um, like I said to you downstairs, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, parts of it felt incredibly awkward. <laughs> and I read a lot of it like like that out of my <laughs> peripheral vision because I wanted to get through it. But some bits are quite because you're squeamish, right? Not because um, it's terrible. Yeah, right? no, no, yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. squeamish. Yeah, <laughs> um, there is some ball loss. There's some ball loss. And I, yeah. well, I feel like I definitely grew a pair to finish it. Like, <laughs> okay, I, yes. I feel, yeah. yeah. Um, but before we get into that, we've talked a lot tonight about masculinity, and 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 Tom was just talking to James about the relationship with his his dad, and you talk a lot about when well, you talk about your family in yeah. parts of the book, and I just wondered, kind of, what. What's your dad like? What sort of relationship do you have with him? And well, it could be a whole other right. chat. Uh, in fact, I have done a whole show about it. My dad uh, is a very fantastic man. He's still with us currently. Uh, he's um, he was my headmaster at school, so that was right. Uh, that wow. was <laughs> so. I wrote. To, um, I think I was the room taught, is with you. <laughs> I was taught by both my parents. I grew. I grew up in. I was born in Yorkshire, but I grew up in Somerset. Uh, and in middle school, my mum was my teacher, uh, and uh, in Upper school, my dad was my headmaster, and then taught me math, maths A level as well. Right. Um, so it's slight. That was slightly difficult. Okay. Uh, but uh, and I tried to blame it on all of my problems in later life. But then I did a show about it and realised I had all those problems before my dad was my headmaster. <laughs> in that I'm quite childish and obsessed with sex, and uh, you know, uh, and uh, show off. So I don't think any of it can really be put down to my. And he was luckily he was a nice headmaster. I think. Weirdly, the other day I was at a book launch uh, and I met some people who my granddad was their headmaster. Wow. Uh, in primary school. Oh, okay. <laughs> they were there. Oh. You've really and, got the education and system. I, and, they so said, not. You, and they said, You're not, your granddad wasn't Mr. Herring. He was horrible. <laughs> so, um, and he used to uh, beat them with, uh, beat them in the old days with sticks and things. So, right. my dad was nicer than that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Good to know. And uh, no, he's quite a popular, quite a popular headmaster, I think. And like, when I ever see anyone from home, they don't talk about my career or, you know, if they see me on telly, they say, how's your dad? How's your dad doing? So, so he was a much-loved headmaster uh, and and a much-loved dad as well. And, and, and he and didn't beat student for sticks? Uh, he did. Well, I think, you know, he might have done for a bit. Right. I think I remember when it came, it was 1981, I think it came and they weren't allowed to do it anymore. They so could, yeah, do, they so could so use I a think, slipper. I got slipper oh, for roller you? skating in the changing did room, you? and that would have been about 1989. Right. It was yeah. all part of the wonderful <laughs> thing of growing up, wasn't it? At least, we didn't, well, at least I didn't go to boarding school. So one of the early parts of the book um, is another thing that, before we get on to balls, um, <laughs> driving. Yeah. Men and directions. Yeah. I, I have a book confirmed a theory of mine, which is that men I don't think like to ask for directions we don't really believe them when they're given to us. <laughs> and we always think that we sort of know where we're going. Yeah. And yeah, and, and, and it's the awkwardness of asking and I think the emasculation of asking someone yeah. for help. Why do you um, think it is emasculating? I don't know. I think just there, you know, and, and I've thought about masculinity a lot and I've done a lot of projects about masculinity before I got to this one forced upon me rather. Uh, and, you know, and I, and I don't think I really conform to like the idea of, a man and, and and lots of ways but then something like that happens and you go you know i'm left driving around the welsh countryside for about an hour getting <laughs> more and more frustrated because i can't work out where i'm meant to be going my sat nav isn't right you know i did actually try to ring some people but there was no phone signal uh and i ended up driving over uh in my frustration ended up driving the wrong way over one of those spike things yeah. to stop you just cut i just caught the edge of it <laughs> uh, and so and, and it was rather again like a pre-sage of what was to come i lost my Back at right hand time. <laughs> so, uh, my car sitting rather sadly in the car park for the week with its with its d deflated. Yeah. But you know, I couldn't. When I lost a ball, I couldn't get a Welsh man to come and in a van <laughs> put a new one on. 
<laughs> it's a gap in the market now, I think. Isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, but I think that's we are we all, however progressive and uh, we think we are. I think there's the, the there's it's very difficult to shift preconceptions, and it's something I've tried to do a lot and with myself. And I thought mm. I did before twenty years ago did this a book and a show called Talking Cock, which yep. was all about the penis. It was an answer to the vagina monologues, but it was sort of trying to. Um, trying to sort of make men think more positively about themselves and realize that in, in the most part women love us and our penises for in, in, if we're in a heterosexual relationship with them um so you know it's sort of weird that i've i've ended up now moving to it'll be the arsehole next right. that's Excellent. What I'm saying. so that's, okay. the, that's the only place i have to that's go now coming in 2024 <laughs> uh, I think, so i think it's from talking cop 2 the bit that i've seen the sequel yeah um is, is that the one where you've got like 8,000 different guys telling you places they've put their penis? Yeah, yeah. Right. So, I mean, there, there was in, there was in, both shows were pretty much there the same. There were some great ideas in that yeah. list. Well, I did an anonymous questionnaire, but it was so, and, and, and it was right, it was sort of 2001 when it did this, and not, you know, the internet was sort of just becoming a We've thing. Got the best people on it. Yeah, well it, was, well, it was, yeah, a little bit, but it was also, it was sort of quite, a, I, I, it was quite a, a, a Forced, you know, clever thing to do accidentally. I just thought, oh, this would be a way to generate some material. And also, I, I'm glad that I asked women. I, so there was a questionnaire for men and a questionnaire for women. Right. And that, and that really turned that show around because it, it it made me, you know, I think until I did that show and got the questionnaire results from women, I kind mm. of thought, oh, women hate men right. and women are scared of men and women, you know, are disgusted by penises. <laughs> just my experience. Um, and, <laughs> and then I found out, you know, that you know, to the most part they aren't, but also that most men are. Um, you know, about each of those issues sort of erections and size and, you know, whatever, they've, they've all got about a third of men thinking, oh, I've got a terrible problem, and most of them really don't have a problem at all. So people live in secrecy because they don't talk. Comedians do talk about this stuff, mm -hmm. um, and, and we should all talk about this stuff because most of the things that you think are embarrassing or terrible or you're, that you're ashamed of are very common or will be understood. And that's what, as a comedian, you realise, you kind of think, oh, this really embarrassing thing has happened to me. Dare I say it on stage? <laughs> will people judge me? And then you'd say it and people laugh because it resonates either because it's so extreme and weird or because, oh, yeah, we've all, you know, we've been in that situation. So, you know, it's it's so important, I think, to talk about things, which is, again, why it's... <clears throat> You know, if, if if anyone had to get to, to testicular cancer, it's good. It was me, because <laughs> I'm very happy to talk about it. Well, I mean, so so, take me through the story, from that sort of, without the driving yeah. and and <laughs> well, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, the driving. I mean, it was it was um, you know, I just uh, it was the 2020 when I saw it, the end of 2020. So it was COVID was going on. Yep. We'd all had that weird year. And I just sort of started thinking there was <clears throat> maybe something like a bit weird in my uh, right testicle. It felt like a bit bigger and a bit heavier. But equally, and I, I joked about this in my stand-up set. As my last stand-up show was about turning 50. Uh, and I joked about how the fact when you get in your 50s, then no one tells you, but there's a good chance you might sit on one of your own testicles. <laughs> I, I, it had never, because gravity takes its effect on me. So I kind of thought, I mean, it, it had never actually happened to me. So I'd done this joke as if it had happened to me. And then I did sit on one of my testicles. And I thought, oh, oh, that's just because I'm middle aged now. Yep. Um, and then it just felt a bit weird, and I kind of put off going to had to do anything about it. And then that I was in Wales for a week, sleeping in an outward bound student hostel, which sounds like a weird thing, but I was, it's, I was, I mean, whatever makes you happy. I was, yeah. I was doing, I was in a film, and that was the accommodation. But it was, it was sort of free. There was no, the central heating had broken. It was miserable, and I was just sort of lying in bed. Every now and again, touching my testicle, thinking, "Is this, is this all right?" So when I got back, I went to the GP just to to put my mind at rest. But it had taken probably a month or. And were you normally so. pretty good about going to the GP, no. or were you one of those like, "It'll be fine"? Well, I'm, I'm not very good, and and you, I'm usually thinking it'll be fine. And there's I've had a couple of issues in the past, and 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 you know, have finally gone or finally been discovered. But I also thought, you know, it's tw it was tw the, it was lockdown. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, and COVID was rampaging through the country. That I don't want to turn up at the GPs with my weird big knacker. They've got more important <laughs> things to, to look at. But you know, I rang up and they saw me like the next day. I think yeah. so. That almost made me think, oh shit, this is serious. <laughs> and this begins quite what seems to be a never-ending queue of people 
who you get to know on quite an intimate basis. Yeah, so yeah. I go, I break every one I meet. I basically break break the world record of how quickly I go from meeting someone to them cupping my testicle. Right. Uh, there was a girl at university who held the record on, until this. <laughs> um, I guess it's a way to meet a lot of people very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but my G, you know, so I went to the GP, and as a comedian, it's a, it, there's a weird edge to all of this because. You know, you you. There's a part of you kind of hoping something terrible happens to you so that you can do a stand-up show or write a book about it. <laughs> so I'm not saying there was a part of me hoping I had testicular cancer, but the GP told me he was pretty sure it wasn't testicular cancer. Happy days. Uh, I was slightly disappointed. I was thinking, I can't. Oh, I can't do. I've started thinking of funny titles for the show. <laughs> uh, I was, but I was generally, you know, happy that I didn't have testicular cancer. But he sent me in to the, get a scan anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was sort of this weird experience because I went in thinking, oh, once again, I'm wasting everyone's time. Yep. Um, and it's quite, I mean, it's a very comedic experience. You the, talk about sitting scanning. in the waiting room looking quite healthy. And, well, yeah, yeah. A, that well, all the way through this, I never felt ill and didn't, you know, I, there was no outward signs, uh, you know, and, and I was sitting in waiting rooms with people who were about to die or who were very ill. So I felt like a fraud all the way through it. But with, when I first went for a scan, they, they asked me my name and address like three or four times, like the very high security, as if there's a lot of men trying to sneak in to get their balls scanned. <laughs> uh, so it might be, because you get like this stuff. It's a very, the, the, it's, so, you know, this is happening. I think there's a stand-up routine in this. Yep. They take you and you put on a gown. They make you lie down and lift the gown up, but they're giving you a piece of, you know, paper. Oh, wow to lift your penis out of the way. So a sort of modesty curtain, so, right. you're, so you're, they can't see your penis. Whilst you're then lying there with your balls and ass, and they're, and they're just glooping up there. And there's yep. a woman watching, and there's just a woman sitting in the corner watching what's going on, and thinking, what's her story? Does she even work at the hospital? Is that how they're, how they're paying for the NHS now? <laughs> I don't, I don't like getting that, but I like someone watching it. I like, yeah, that's yeah, that's why, that's why I like. So it was all, you know, but, but I was also thinking, I'm, I'm wasting a time. I know this is, this is epididymitis. That's what the doctor told me, you know. So, right. I, you know, it's, there's nothing to worry about. And so this one was scanning very diligently away. I was thinking, this is really taking a time. I was thinking, is it like a baby is... scan? Do you see something on the screen? <laughs> it, it isn't like a baby oh. scan. I thought it, it would, but they don't show, they didn't uh, turn the, maybe they did. I well, mean, I would, I, I, do, I, do, I did a joke in the sitcom version of this where it is being like scanned at a, a supermarket and they did find an, un, an unexpected item in the bagging area. So it's, um, <laughs> which I didn't. I'm, I wasn't uh, so chirpy and chipper as it was happening. I wasn't making jokes as it happened in real life. But, it, I, you know, I felt very confident that it was there was nothing wrong. And mm -hmm. so I, and she said, there's something there. And I said, yes, yeah, the epididymitis. She said, well, it might be, that might be part of it, but there's, like, there's, a, there's something there. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you know, I kind of went back to the car in a bit of a daze, and I rang my wife and uh, said, "Yeah, there's something, there's something going on." But I don't. It wasn't. I don't think I'd really taken it in at that stage, mm. or I thought, well, you know, that there'll, there'll be something. That we'll go in, and there'll be another. I mean, there'll be another thing we have to do, and then we'll find out it's fine. So I wasn't too worried. Um, but uh, I then got home, and the GP called, and it was sort of very much like in a film. I was playing in the living room with my kids and my wife, right. and my son was really laughing, and the phone rang, and I thought, oh, I'd better go out and take the phone. And I took the phone, and then a very shaky voice, this GP had been very casual and jokey, was suddenly shaking, who'd said, it's you know, I'm, I'm not a betting man, but I'm 99% certain this isn't cancer. And then suddenly he was shaky voice and saying, you know, I, you know, I, you, I, there's something Oops. in there, and... Uh, <laughs> I, I can't, and he wouldn't say the word cancer now, having, you know, so it, it was like, it was, it was really weird. And my son was laughing in the next room and I was thinking, oh, fuck, I'm going to die. Mm. And, and so that was the real, that was the, the shaky moment. And that, that was the only time it really, um, you know, I certainly wasn't thinking, oh, oh, oh good, I can do my stand up show now. <laughs> uh, I was, you know, I, I was thinking about my son and I was thinking of, you know, my kids were three and five at that time. So you sort of think, you know, you, you, you think about them, but then you start thinking selfishly about yourself. And mm -hmm. in the book, I kind of progressed that out to me imagining my 
wife kind of marrying some mustachioed man in a cowboy hat or drink all my whiskey but it was <laughs> I've been saving for a special occasion that would never come um, but you know I really suddenly thought oh god I'm, go- I'm actually going to die and I'd lost a friend just before Covid mm. uh, a friend of mine who was only a year old than me and had it, similarly had a, a seven year old son had died of cancer and everyone I knew who'd had cancer had died you know so mm. the minute I thought I had cancer I thought you know this is I've got months or you know, maybe not months ago. So it was, you know, that was a very shaky and upsetting moment. I mean, there's a bit in the book where, <clears throat> I'll just read from it. It says, um, I had already decided that positivity was going to be my way through this. Humour was going to be my coping mechanism. And whatever happened next, I would be making light of it. It's how I've treated everything in my life. And it would be hypocritical if now something a bit unpleasant was happening to me, I suddenly got all serious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when does that bit kick in? <laughs> well, it was pretty quickly because it's still, you know, I mean, if you've got to get cancer of anywhere, mm. the testicles are definitely the funniest. I mean, and cancer isn't funny, but testicle cancer is the funniest place you can get cancer. <laughs> uh, so, you know, and I, there was all sorts of ironies in it, you know, having done all this work on ma- masculinity, on, on male genitalia. I'd even done a show where I'd grown a Hitler moustache Yep. to try and reclaim it for comedy for Charlie Chaplin. Right. Uh, now How did was, that go? It, not very well. Right. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to encourage people to vote to stop fascism, and that didn't work out either. Uh, but now I, was, now I was also, you know, taking on Hitler's ball as well. So it yeah. was... Uh, um, so it was, everything sort of seemed to be, like, pushed mm-hmm. together. So, you know, but it, 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 it there's so many funny things in it, and it was nearly everything that happens a lot, all along the way It was comic. And it is a great way to cope with it because, the, you yeah. know, there's nothing you can do. You know, there's not, if you've got cancer, you're, it's not a battle with cancer. You're the battlefield. Yeah. Other people are fighting to get rid of the cancer for you. But you, there's nothing. You can keep a positive frame of mind, which may be helpful. Uh, but, you know, I think it helps you. Uh, and I think, you know, I think like, like that says, it would be hypocritical if I'd laughed at. I've done shows about death. I've done shows mm. about religion. You know, I've, I've done shows about other people being stupid, mainly myself being stupid. And it would be weird if I've got all po-faced and went, oh, no, I'm going to be serious because I've got cancer. Um, I never, you know, I still, it, it feels really weird even thinking I've had cancer. And so I didn't know it was cancer until after the ball was taken out. And that's the, so by the, they say, we can't tell you until the ball's out whether it's cancer or not. Right. And I thought it better bloody well be cancer. Yeah, 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 you're, taking my, you're taking my ball out. You better not come back and go, sorry, there was a smudge on the scanner. Yeah. <laughs> they can't put it back in again. So, you know, so all of it, all of it, so, you know, and that was, that was my only criticism with the, with the NHS over this whole thing, and they were amazing, was mm. what they didn't, they, wouldn't, they weren't allowed to talk about cancer until it was confirmed as cancer, right. which also meant they didn't tell me until after I'd had the operation that testicular cancer has a basically 95 to 99% survival rate, right. which would have been extremely nice to, to know really. about. <laughs> <laughs> know about it. it was only a month it's like or so. you're not really trying. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so it would have been nice to know that it wasn't... I would still have been scared and there were still other things that, it, that could have gone wrong. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm out of the woods, but it was... You know, it's. I think you can be light about it because, and whilst treating the subject seriously, and mm. I think you know that I do talk about other people with cancer in the book, and I do talk about the, these other people around me, and I'm certainly not laughing at anyone mm. who's going through. You know, I, I had chemotherapy, but like a very light. It was all my, everything felt just like a sort of. I talk about it being like a total recall, you know, hol- <laughs> holiday. You've got the total recall package of going to pretend to have cancer uh, and you can you can experience it all without any of the problems. But it's weird, isn't it? Because from, from what I've read of the process, it seems like they front load a lot of the decisions you have to make, not knowing whether it's cancer or not. Yeah. And then there's, there's, there's quite a few pages that deal with the prosthetic testicle yep. dilemma. Yeah. Which sounds like one of the sort of stranger John le Carré <laughs> spy, spy films. But um, so they make you, well, they ask you if you want one. Yeah, and then so the, a first whole... que- the first question was, you know, would you would you want to have a prosthetic? So you're going to, when you lose a testicle, you have to decide, uh, do you want to store, store any sperm? It's a bit like and... deal or no deal. <laughs> it is. Right? Do you want to store any sperm because you may become infertile because of the chemotherapy? Uh, and, you know, um, again, I'm, 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 most people who get testicular cancer are young. Right. So this is like... Um, it's quite unusual for someone in the 50s. Do you have to yeah. decide there and then, or can you phone a friend? <laughs> well, I did phone my wife, and right. uh, and uh, we still... We, we I said we would keep store sperm, and then we decided not to because we thought we'd hold everything up, and we don't. I don't want any more kids. Um, so, uh, But, yeah, the prosthetic was the next thing, and I was, you know, I just... Uh, I, for me, it was like, 
uh, I, no, I don't want to have a false board because I couldn't work out. You were working who, in different situations where you might need one. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, you, but you're only doing it for yourself, which is fine. I'm not saying it, it's, if you want one, if you're in this situation, do have one. But, <laughs> it, but you're only doing it for yourself because mm. I don't think no, no one's... If people are noticing... The uh, the backing singers there, <laughs> then the front man isn't very charismatic. Is, there, is, there, is, is what has to be said. So I'm yeah. I'm pretty I'm pretty certain if I if I hadn't told my wife that I'd had a testicle move, I don't think she, she would have known. Could have got away with it. I honestly don't think she had, not because she doesn't right. she's not down in that area, <laughs> but just you're not counting the money. Is what I'm saying. Then you're down there, you're not yeah, what, working out. If you, if you find one, you think that's a result. <laughs> Let's move on. Yeah, so fair enough. You know, I don't think you notice it, and 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 it's so it's a, it's you know I can understand for your own if you're worried, but you if you're worried about a potential love, if if, if anyone's in the situation where they're seeing your testicles, you've got you've got over that for work. You're in suppose, yeah. <laughs> for work, but you know, or in the changing rooms, which again, I think if you're a 17 year old boy, you might be more self conscious than changing rooms. But nobody's looking mm. at your testicles in the changing rooms, and if they are, they're the person. Wrong the kind problem. of gym. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it didn't work out for Charlie Borman, did it? No, well, Charlie Borman, who I resemble, I'm often mistaken for. Right. Um, we thought we'd booked him. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Someone once came to, up to me in a bar and said, "Well done on the long way round," and, and I didn't know what it was. I said, "What?" He said. You know, when you cycle around the world with you, McGregor, Thank you very uh, much. like I like I was Charlie Borman and had forgotten that. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, so, it, so I've been playing for him a couple of times, uh, and he's has my face and uh, and also a lot of testicles. So it's kind of, but he got a false, he, he got a prosthetic. Um, but he finds because what they do is they sew it into your scrotum. So when he's on his motorcycle with Ewan McGregor, sometimes he, he can sit on it. Whoop. <laughs> and then it, that's quite painful, right? So, but he still kept it in there, so you must like it. <laughs> you, can take, you, can go, you can go and take it out, or you can go and back and, you know, she's having for casual or for best. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so there's, and I think you can select sizes and all sorts of things, but I, I, never, I never got into... One with Bluetooth or yeah. something. Yeah. No, um, and then... Not like Someone did suggest that my po- I'm doing a podcast, and that is a, that is a possibility. Putting <laughs> <laughs> Wi-Fi in your testicle. Yeah, like control the fridge with yeah. it or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And and also, but right up to the point where you have the operation, yeah, I was alarmed and struck by the system by which they let the surgeon know which one to remove. Because yeah. it seemed quite a high-risk <laughs> strategy. I, I spotted, it's my job to spot problems. Events yeah. are a series of problems to be solved. And I spotted a lot of problems in the technique that they used. Do you want to just yeah, talk well, they, about that? Yeah, they drew an arrow on my right hand. Yeah. But towards my right hand, which you know, I, I just was worried. Right, they would, might take my hand off. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> because they, but I, you know, I These would are just busy guys. I would just say, you know, get each just before the operation, like Easter eggs. <laughs> you could just dip your testicle with a testicle into like coloured paint. Yeah, put some spots on it. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, and then that's the one that's, spray that's, the one that's going off this yeah. one. So yeah, I was a bit, you know, I was worried. You are sort of worried. It's a that's a frightening prospect, and I've never been under anaesthetic with general anaesthetic before. Uh, and they offered me local anaesthetic, which I just no. absolutely no, 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 cannot understand how anybody would want to be awake. <laughs> but it was I think act- you'd probably have to talk. Yeah. You? Well, you, but you'd. I mean, I, I, I am very squeamish, so I think even catching a glimpse of my own testicle, yeah. <laughs> even diseases as it was coming out of my body, would have been a bit too. I'd have passed out anyway. So yeah, so I was. You know, you're concerned about not not waking up or waking up during the operation. Yeah. Or, um, but yeah, I actually loved the anaesthetic. Was was and just a spirit. You were a big fan about that. Yeah. I loved it. I thought it was because it because it felt like dying, and it, the, and if I had died, that I would it would have been dying. And it was just, it was just lovely. You just drift, you drift away, and then you're just, you're just gone. You're just, and then if they bring you back, you're back. Yeah. And if they don't, you don't. And it was, it just made me not. I, it, I don't think there's anything after you die. And this made me think there's nothing after you die because, right. it, because you that hour or however long that was, mm-hmm. there was just there was nothing. There was and there was no soul and there was no consciousness. There was no dreams. It was just slipped away, then slipped back in, and nice. you know, and it was just so gentle and. 
I mean, no, not all deaths are going to be as gentle as that, but, <laughs> right. but hopefully. Yeah, but then you, you know, wake up and you've lost a hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One hand down, wrong ball. I, I, I still don't understand why they couldn't just read the notes. But, um, <laughs> so, but and, is it my right or your right? That's the problem. <laughs> and I did that. I, I, I put the book down. I was reading it in bed and I put the book down and did that. <laughs> and then, just, you know, left, right. But anyway, that's it was just me. Um, throughout the book, uh, um, you talk about your family and, and how... You, sort of, you, you, you talk to them about it and there was quite a nice bit I think where you sort of you, you're talking to your wife about it and she's very matter of fact like it'll be fine it's all fine and you're I think you're in the middle of that oh my god I've got cancer I'm gonna die yeah type thing but it seems I mean you know waiting in car parks in hospital car parks spending an absolute fortune waiting for you to come out of various yeah. procedures and things um was she instantly on board with the using humor to kind of get through it. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the, she, the the debate we had about it, and I didn't, because I, I write a blog every day. I've written a blog every day for 20 years, and I don't really write about very personal stuff in it, and certainly if it involves other people. But I wasn't writing about this, and I was doing uh, live Twitch shows all the way through this as well, So uh, and doing my podcast. And so it was hard to hide it. It's occasionally, like, there were little hints that I was worried that mm. something was wrong. Uh, but I was wanting to get human. The thing we, we discussed was whether I should talk about the, it happening. Yeah. Um, she was happy for me to joke about it. I think she's a comedian as well. She is much more serious and sensible than I am in real life. But uh, I think she understood that it was a good way through. But yeah, she was worried that if I, once the genie was out of the bottle, it was out. And, I, and, 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 and we discussed about, you know, just it getting in on mm. Chortle, which is the comedy website or whatever, and then it's out and then you... And I, and I sort of decided that, you know, I need, once it was happening, I was going to need to explain why I was... Yeah. taking a week off all my work and all that sort of stuff anyway. Um, and I thought, you know, I thought, again, I, I wanted to be able to talk about it because I thought it might be useful for other people. As it was, it was. I found it, it was, the minute I talked about it, uh, I tweeted about it, mm -hmm. um, I got so many tweets from p other people who'd been through it and some saying, oh, did that happen to me 30 years ago and I'm fine. Mm -hmm. People I knew who I'd ne who'd never told me that they'd lost the testicle would would DMing me and saying, yeah, look, it'll be fine. And so actually it was incredibly reassuring. You know, I'm really glad I talked about it. Mm -hmm. As much for a few people, you know, from Twitter have then gone and got examined and, and, and been found out that they had a problem. And so, right. you know, that's an amazing thing to think that just by me tweeting about it, it's helped someone else on their journey to be well. But, um, but you know, it, I think more so it really helped me realise there was this, you know, group. And, and now if anyone, you know, emails me or mm. uh, tweets me or whatever about it and saying I'm going through it, I will take time to discuss it with them because I think it's, you know, and say, let me know how it goes and, pick, and have little conversations over every few months with, with various guys who go, oh, yeah, no, this has happened, I'm fine. And so it's great just to be, again, it's all about talking. I think, yeah. like, because the fear comes from, you know, not from, from bottling things yeah. up, from not knowing the truth. And so even if someone were to say, you know, I, I, weirdly, I bumped into someone in Centre Parks uh, <laughs> on that last one. Always the start of a he great said, story. Oh, you know, you've got what? You've got one testicle. I said, yeah. He said, oh, I've had that. Careful. Uh, I lost. I lost the other one as well. You have to remember that. Uh, a couple of years later, I had it returned in the other one. So don't be complacent. Um, <laughs> seemed very jolly about it. Um, but, but you know, but then you know, because you because but you know, so I think a lot of this the masculinity and losing part of your genitalia, losing yeah. your balls, which is so associated with masculinity, but as I discussed in the book for yeah. spurious reasons. But you worry, you know, so I was worried about sex whether would it affect my sexual performance, would it affect um, you know, my, my would I would I become less of a man, mm -hmm. would it affect my uh, my uh, hormones and that sort of thing. So, you know, there was lots of things to worry about. So it was reassuring to talk to other people. You're still feeling pretty manly? Uh, I'm feeling as manly as I did before. Which probably like, what, eight to ten manly? <laughs> my, my, uh, my testosterone is, the, the, the remainder is, uh, you know, he's doubled his efforts. Right. And, uh, nice. He's, he's glad, well, it was great. To, I, the time I regretted not having the prosthetic for the first week after the operation, because the first time I looked at is myself... Is this the jockstrap week? The, anyway, I had a terrible week with the jockstrap, because I got uh, well, we'll talk, maybe talk about that. But I looked, <laughs> the first time I looked at myself in the mirror... Uh, I realised, like, on one side, I looked like uh, an adult male. Then I turned around on the other side, I looked like a sort of prepubescent boy. <laughs> and I thought, that's if that's how it's going to be, you know, maybe I could do a music hall act. Like the, uh... <laughs> but, um... but then... Just very quick... leaning to one side. So <laughs> <laughs> but then very quickly, the, the Remainer 
uh, realised uh, that the other one had gone and just sort of moved into the middle. So oh, it's fine. like he's just realising <laughs> he had the double bed to himself. So, <laughs> it's, right. so it's fine. So, you, I mean, you, you kept or you, you, you carried on doing the Twitch stuff um, sort of pretty much throughout, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, looking back at it, it's sort of insane, but it was great to have something. It was really, as it was through lockdown, yeah. it was just amazing to have that stuff to do. So I start, I, you know, I had a kind of creative second period where I came up with I mean there's some of them were old ideas but I'd, I've been doing kind of some crazy esoteric podcasts yep. where I played myself a snooker and tried to clear stones off a field uh, and I was sort of able to do video versions of those the stones off a field thing <laughs> is worth a whole other talk I mean it's 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 this sort of exercise in futility it and is. It's exploration about, of human nature it's and, sort of an art project but it's again yeah. it, but as a performance thing it's very interesting because it's improvised and you create a, I've created a world of gods and uh, opponents and all sorts of things. But anyway, uh, that's just my mental problems. Uh, <laughs> but then I also did this ventriloquist show. Which, yes. But again, uh, so my great granddad, uh, who God knows what he did to children, uh, my granddad's <laughs> father uh, created, my granddad was beating my, my granddad used these d dummies at school as well. Um, uh, he he made these ventriloquist dummies in 1892. We know that because we found some newspaper inside with 1892 on it. Brilliant. Uh, and uh, they're called Ali and Sally, so it was mainly Ali I used. It's this kind of quite terrifying Victorian... Well, we've got a clip, uh, actually. Yeah. Um, and, well, let's watch the clip. I think you'll be able to guess what the puppet is about. But let's... Yeah. So... So the way that you spoke to the cancer was to have a talking <laughs> testicle puppet with teeth. Yes. Right. Um, and, you know, again, I debated long and hard whether this was a good idea and <laughs> so whether this is a good way to process it. Yeah. Um, that now I've got a jacket, I've got like a rod hull jacket, so with a false arm around it, so it looks a bit... <laughs> so the testicle sits there and I've got a very obviously false arm right. that the hand keeps falling off of. Um, uh, but I, I've, got, I've been doing all these puppets and I've mm. been you know I've been talking to them and the puppets been saying to me you know what happens to us if you die and all that sort of stuff uh, and then I thought maybe it would be interesting to create and I'm not the only one to do this actually Justin Hawkins one of the, one of the Hawkins brothers from the darkness oh, yeah. uh lost a testicle and uh, and uh, one of them made a puppet that they was uh, for I think Justin made a pu puppet for the best man speech at his <laughs> wedding um and also sang two became one which is what I did with mine <laughs> right. um uh, so, you know, I thought it'd be an interesting thing to, a way to kind of try and process the, the cancer, to talk to the cancer, because it is a, you know, that's a weird thing for something. And, you know, and I've had a, I've, I've been in a lot of double acts and, mm. uh, you know, they've all gone quite badly. But this is, <laughs> this, none of them, it's never been this bad. Uh, I thought this, I thought that was one double act that would stay together. But um, so I, I kind of wanted to. Uh, see what would happen if I, I use yep. it. It's sort of it is a weird thing, you know, and it's a it's. But the puppets are weird because it, it does feel like a, a diff, you know. I get to the point where it feels like I'm talking to you. Look completely different. engrossed, yeah. in that one, yeah. And and I guess the I guess the next part of the story is the world starts to return to some kind of normality. You get through the treatment. I don't know. We might come back to the jock strap, but there's a jock strap <laughs> period. Um, They've already talked about gay saunas and lube tonight. I think I don't know the audience is ready for jockstraps. Um, and you kind of, well, you, the, it's the Taskmaster, Champion of Champions, filming sort of yeah. kicks in. And you kind of, you mention it a couple of times in the book and it becomes almost like this sort of totemic exercise. Like, I'm going to do this no matter how bad I feel. If I, It seems to be like if I do this filming, I really want to do this. I, it feels like a milestone in beating... Yeah, the there was a couple. So there's a couple of things. I wanted to run a half marathon, and I wanted to in the, in the same year. And I wanted, and I wanted to be. You know, the thing, the problem was that the I was scheduled to record the tasks of Taskmaster on the first of March, mm. and my operation turned out to be February the twenty fourth. So like tight. five, yeah, a little bit too tight. Uh, so they and I was meant to not do anything for four weeks, anything of any exertion. Mm. But the latest date that Taskmaster could. To film those tasks before they moved on to the next series was like the 21st of March or something. So three weeks after my operation, I had to do my tasks on Taskmaster. Uh, and it's quite, you know, and I look pretty ropey and, and bad in them. <laughs> and, uh, but it was, but it was a great, you know, it was, I really wanted to do it because I'd done the yeah. series and I loved doing the series, but it was like Champion of Champions. It was a big deal and it would have been really a shame to... I've got a short it. clip, actually. Come on, we have to... <laughs> I mean, and I, in the book, you talk about Daisy Cooper yeah. being furious 
But yeah, you're, you're loving the fact she's being furious. Well, I'm te- I was terrified, to be fair. I thought, I honestly thought she would uh, kill me at that point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was quite scary. But yeah, that was that was so that was the year before. That was the original t- Taskmaster. But yeah, so it was so, and I'd, I'd managed to beat her in the on the last task and right. the last. The very last moment of the last task, and sort of just won the, uh, won the won the original, and then yeah. So the, the task about champion championship wasn't, you know, I, I sort of was good to. I was just glad to be doing it, and also by the time we did the studio, I would kind of really looked. I decided to look after myself. It hasn't quite, I haven't managed to quite keep it up, but I'm mm-hmm. trying to keep it up. But I'd sort of been really healthy. I've been practicing, running for this marathon. I'd really looked after my diet because all this made me, you know, this experience uh, made me realise how much I wanted to be alive mm-hmm. uh, and certainly for my kid, you know, and, and have, give myself a chance of seeing my kids to grow up. So, so it, it's quite a nice, that Taskmaster, because the, on the tasks, I'm, I'm pretty fucked. And in yeah. the studio, I look as the, about the best I've ever looked in uh, 20 years. <laughs> so, uh, it's, yeah. We'll be, uh, if anyone has anything, you know, a story they'd like to share or an experience um, that they want to share about, uh, please don't, you don't feel, you have to stand up and say you have to stick your cancer, that's fine. But if, if there's anything you want to share to, to the conversation, just wave at me sort of violently and we'll get a microphone to you. Um, but just while, before we do that, there was a really touching part of the book where you talk about the importance of making memories with your children. Yeah. And there's a nice bit where you talk about kite flying and there's the dog poo snowman. Yeah, there's a dog which poo is also good. Um, how... <laughs> That was obviously during like one of the serious thinking moments where you're thinking, I've got the cancer, I might have cancer, this might not turn out so well. Just sort of talk us through like the thought processes of wanting to create memories with your children. Well, you know, it, it, it was sort of realising my kids were so young and, they, and the idea that they would, especially with my, my son who was three, you know, and you've been through so much with them and the idea of them not even remember, you know, I think my daughter would just about remember me my son would have no idea, he wouldn't remember me, you know, mm. if I died when he was uh, three. And, and you know, it made, made me, you know, it made me realise I want to spend it, and lockdown did as well, just I enjoyed the time with my family. Mm. And it sort of, it's reset my mind a bit. So I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm much more staying at home. Right. And, and, you know, than I would have done. And, I, you know, and I, I'm with the family. But, you know, I sort of, yeah, I was sort of, it was, but it's, it was very much like in, in Groundhog Day where, where, um, Bill Murray sort of trying to create the perfect moment with Andy yep. McDowell that you go if you try it, it gets fucked yeah, yeah, up yeah. you know so it, it works when it's spontaneous so but I was aware that I you know maybe I had a couple of months to kind of make some memory that my daughter would remember me by so it's when it snowed I thought perfect yeah. I remember all the days it snowed you know as a kid we'll do this we'll go out and but it all turned into slush and my wife took a film of, of her throwing a massive snowman at me and a snowball at me and I remember Feel you know. I remember feeling, oh god, you know, they'll be what when I'm dead, they'll be watching. And so I'm trying to smile, but thinking, oh, imagine and what then, the soundtrack would be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then so this would just be a sad moment. So I was sad, and then we went. We we finally got back to the garden to start making these snowmen. But my dog had died. my my cat I'd forgot. My cats and dogs have been shitting all over the the lawn, and so we kind of pushed it around, and just there was this dog shit all over this. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's it was a beautiful a, memory. And so you think, this isn't the memory that I wanted my <laughs> my daughter to have. And so, and again, finally, it was sort of like the day after, um, the day after I'd been told I was going to have mm. the uh, remove, the ball removed. She just, it had just been in my daughter's uh, sixth birthday. Um, and it was, we, we got these kites, I think we got them for Christmas actually, but we, we took the kite out onto the wreck and we'd never flown it and we were having difficulty getting it going and even putting it together. And then we, me and her sort of went away and it was really blustery and it was sort of almost like, in my memory, it's like lightning and stuff, which it wasn't, wasn't happening, but it felt sort of... We managed to get this kite really aloft and my daughter was brilliant at it and mm. really enjoying it. And she just liked this wizard and I was doing it and it would fail and she would laugh. And I just thought, you know, it was this, it was this <laughs> amazing moment. You think, and that's it, you know, it happened by, you know, by accident or it happened, it just, without trying, you'd created this moment that where I, you know, I'm certainly going to remember that forever and hopefully she'll also remember it. We just, we really, really sort of bond. We, you know, we always had this weird relationship where yeah. she's, she she's very she's very lovey dovey to a mum but very sarcastic to me. She calls you and Richard. So she calls me. She yeah. calls me Richard. <laughs> she draw. She through lockdown. She kept on. I had to do homeschooling with her, and she wouldn't do anything. I said, "You can do anything. Just draw a picture, and then at least we've done something." Hmm. And she went to it. She went fine. Went to her desk and sort of scribbled this picture really quickly. Came back and said, "That's you falling into lava," <laughs> and had done this pretty impressive picture of me. And then. 
And then because I hate you and said, yeah, I've got that bit. And then she said, wait. And then she took it back and then quickly drew the something else and came back. And then there was a croc. I was falling into the mouth of a crocodile <laughs> in the lava. Just to be sure. Going to eat me. So that was, you know, and that became a running joke. And she did that a few times. And then she did it in sort of sweet ways. And there is the book I forgot. There was a she drawn a you know she drew a picture of us two holding hands. And when we'd and when we'd when I came back from the hospital after the operation, she'd sort of left me loads of presents of hula hoops and stuff on the bed and stuff. And nice. um, and so you kind of go, okay, she does underneath all this sarcasm. Sure. <laughs> she, I think she likes me. But so so it was just you know it was great for us to have this uh, forty five minutes where we did something kind of sort of magical together. So, you know. It's it, it's a lovely part of the book. I love the little wizard. <laughs> I think I can see someone there with a microphone. Hello, sir. Hi. Oh, tell us who you are. But I'm Brian. Hi, Brian. I've had a few medical issues down there. Hadrosials, I've oh, had yes. twists, and eventually uterine strictures. So I have to self-catheter once a week. Okay. And some people at work, I never, ever heard of self catheterization, I just went. Did you have to do that at all? No, I didn't. No, no. Because it's one of those things. People go, "Well, what do you do?" And I said, "Well, I've got one in my locker, and it's like a fifteen-inch pipe that I have to insert down the tip of my penis." Right. Once a week. And it's it's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> Some people would like it though. That's the thing. <laughs> well, I, it's just it's interesting. People at work were just like, "So why do you do it?" And like, <laughs> I, I, no, yeah. Not for pleasure. <laughs> I mean, I, actually, I hit a fence post up on um, BMX. And it, I was going to thought. I thought uh, when you put it up your penis, or that's you being put that too far, mate. But yeah, I mean, you hit I, a fence post. I, I, Sorry, guys. I, 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 I finished my testicles, and I thought they thought at that point I was going to have to lose both my testicles. Right, I didn't. It was just very bruised. And, but unfortunately, it's left me with useful stricture. So. Yeah. Just, well, but, you know, like all these things, what I think is interesting about it, and, you know, that was, having lost one, I was sort of really terrified about losing the other one and then thinking, what what does that mean and what's the... Re but, you know, you they, they everything's so fantastic now so that there, there, there are ways around that even mm. if you do end up losing both your testicles, there are there are things that can be done which will, you know, which still make you operational. Which I think it would be would be most uh, most. And I don't think you can have children, uh, but, uh, but that, not that operational. But you know, it's uh, you know, so it's it's amazing what can be done. And 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 again, I think it is it feel, because it's it's sort of weird. You know, it's such a sensitive area. It's such a, a badly protected area. It's a badly designed system. <laughs> Or designed by maybe it's designed be a by, joke, right? designed by a woman, yeah. maybe. <laughs> um, and you know, so like it's crazy that it's the balls are, are signify masculinity because they're the weakest, the weakest part of the human body, really. You know, so it's it's um, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it, you know, as I, as I think we're starting to understand, sort of gender is about more than our bodies anyway but uh, yeah it's i mean the book is also it's punctuated with like a scientific and cultural history of yes. balls really um it, i felt sorry for the beavers <laughs> the self-castrating beavers yeah that was unfortunate yeah. for them mainly because it made me think of there was a, a, a news item it must have been in the week's odd news and it was a story of a raccoon somewhere in America that it was a freezing cold weather and his balls got frozen to the railway track. Nice. And the, good. No, but the workman freed him by pouring hot tea over his bum. <laughs> and then they freed him with a shovel and then he ran off into the woods. So <laughs> it, it had a happy ending. And his balls were stuck on the railway. <laughs> um, yeah, it, you know, but near, the interesting thing that nearly all the stories about uh, testicles that we know or that, that, that you know, all the theories about them, mm. Uh, just a nonsense. There's so much nonsense in there, you know. And like for a long time, it, it was, I wanted to do that partly because that's what talking the book Talking Cock was like as well. But for so, you know, until the 19th century, people believed that one testicle produced boys and one testicle produced girls. Be a great um, system. <laughs> but until the 19th century, people believed that you know that women were basically just a grow bag and that that had sper that were. Each sperm was an homunculi, so it was a little man that went in and grew inside the woman. <laughs> so the woman really had nothing to do with, uh, and it was all you know. So like it's it's absolutely insane the the, the way these t because people won't talk about them and won't investigate them. I and mean, they've just discovered snakes out about snake clitorises, haven't they? Because no one's ever investigated that. <laughs> because, they're, because scientists are only interested in That's got to be penises. on a menu somewhere. <laughs> so, like, science is, you know, is skewed by being all white men yep. <laughs> doing it and history's all white men doing it and, and just this nonsense that comes out from not... Partly because of religion, I think, as well, but, you know, religious worries, but it's... it's 
again, and the more people talk about it, the more people are open about it. You know, it is. It's still. I think it's it's great that people are still laughing because I think it is still funny. But it's nothing. There's no embarrassment. You know, it's good that you're not. You don't. I think twenty years ago. You'd have, it would have been very hard for you or I to. I mean, Matt, I would have been able to do it because that was my job. But you know, but it would have been. I think I might not have talked about the testicular cancer twenty years ago. So it's interesting how men, men are changing. Well, I mean, thanks to those parts of the book, I'm now an invaluable addition to uh, any pub quiz team yeah. in the in the testicular round. Um, but no, so can I have my ball back? We've got some copies of it available outside in the foyer. Uh, Richard has kindly signed some. Um, I think we've arrived at a position that masculinity can be a load of balls yeah. in every sense. Um, thank you for thank you for this. Thank, thank you, you for being here tonight. Um, folks, a big round of applause, please, for, for Richard. Thank you. Thanks for watching that video. If you enjoyed that, we think you'll love these. And if you want to join us for the next live recording of Tortoise Lates, head to tortoisemedia.com forward slash book.